Unsere nächsten Speaker kommen beide aus Ulm, sind sehr interessiert in Open Data und Mobilität und werden über die Verkehrswende selber hacken mit euch sprechen. Welcome to uh, this translation of the talk, uh, Hacking Your Own Tra Traffic Revolution. Your translators are going to be um, Waffle, Whitey Chan and Ningvi. And uh, the speakers are Robbie Five and Uban Verlai. Thank you. Welcome to uh, Hack Your Own Traffic or Transit Revolution. Like many of you, we use mobility every day. And all of us um, pay directly or indirectly for this kind of infrastructure. And honestly, it's not great. The first contact with uh, public transport is very exhausting for most people. And that's a bit disappointing because we want to have great transit that can be used without having to think about it. And from this frustration, uh, we got our motivation to do it a bit better. And so how can you, as open data activists, hack your own transit revolution? This is uh, the first thing uh, many people think of. I Photoshop this myself, by the way. <laughs> it's uh, always nice to be rewarded for your Photoshop skills. That's the first thing many people think of when they hear traffic revolution and mobility. But of course, it's not great because it's one part of mobility. It's um, electro vehicles. And it's more of a revolution in propulsion than uh, in mobility. And of course, it's important because you don't want to <laughs> diesel, uh, have your buses diesel all over the place. I brought you my favorite picture. It's uh, from 1990 from the uh, city of Münster. And I think it's still very up to date because it shows how much space you uh, need to move 72 people with varying modes of transport and you can see that the car takes up in an incredible amount of space and of course takes this amount of space in our cities and this is we have the very same problem with electric vehicles they still need the same amount of space possibly even more because uh, cars have grown in size we like to speak like technologists like to speak of uber and call it ride sharing but there's not a lot of sharing being done there it's more of a taxi and if Uber wasn't there, maybe that car wouldn't be driving in the first place. And of course, uh, the bleeding edge of mobility is autonomous driving. We currently have an occupancy rate of 1.1 to 1.2 people per car. And autonomous driving might, uh, get us, uh, <laughs> might uh, make it possible to actually get below one for the first time. So less uh, than one person per average per car. You're applauding, but it's not a good thing. It means that we need more space. And of course, this um, lack of balance in our cities is um, a problem in our cities. And uh, this is what uh, ride sharing companies thought of too. They wanted to optimize things that tech companies, they collect a lot of data and they know what trips uh, people like to take. And so they said, all right, we're going to optimize this. How about we have regular scheduled routes along these routes that people uh, often take and maybe let's not uh, pick them up at their front door maybe just let's have them run along a, a line and uh, yeah at scheduled intervals well done silicon valley you invented the bus it's nice for these ride sharing companies but it's really silly because they're attacking public transport which should be the backbone of the mobility revolution and it also means that these operators only focus on the regions where there are there's a financial interest for them and that's probably just city centers so, so they're not going to serve um, the suburbs maybe or places where people don't uh, can't afford transport so they're they're rebuilding public transport but only for rich people there's no uh, regulation to um, accessibility either and it's uh, a lot of cherry picking and they're simply uh, 
picking the uh, picking cherries and letting uh, leaving the rest on the table. And public transport planners have a problem too. They could go and say, "All right, we have these commercial operators offering their services." How can we integrate that into our system? But the thing is, these operators can be gone as quickly as they came. I don't know how many of these uh, scooter operators are going to survive the winter, but even larger companies that have been on the market for a while, they, um, like, such as car to go they recently retired completely from the American market. And there's a huge gap now. Even after six or seven years, people still... Uh, People are still uh, sad for their departure. It's a bit, it's like the Google Reader effect. Um, but everything is going to be great now because ride sharing companies are looking for their next big thing. Bicycles are definitely better than cars. They're all um, buying, the, buying uh, up companies. Lyft, for example, bought uh, social bikes, Uber bought a jump. And so you simply um, gobble up these companies and the uh, the next mode of transport. But it's not about being environment environmentally friendly. It's about uh, building platforms, because these ca companies want to have as many modes of possible in their in their apps and um, be able to extend their monopoly. And of course, they have to serve the hype. These. Uh, Startups are less driven by innovation than they often uh, say. They're more driven by hype. And, of course, there's this uh, golden age, uh, or this uh, gold digging uh, mentality where the gold rush, where people, the people profiting are the ones who own the... Uh, the, uh, the sh and so, yeah, we uh, try to, you know, shop around for all of this equipment that is needed to have a bike sharing system. Uh, we could just click that together online. And in Munich, you know, there were lots and lots of these bikes, but nobody, you know, dared to uh, try something like this. And so we just started a fake startup and went shopping on Alibaba. Um, the companies on there, you know, we've asked about, like, you know, we're a startup, we need locks for our bikes, we need documentation for the locks for our bikes, um, because, you know, for privacy reasons, we would like to build the app ourselves. And the fun thing about that is that these companies, you know, were like, yeah, let's talk about it. Um, one of the <coughs> one of them said, you know, sign an NDA, give us uh, 10 grand and we'll give you the money back in locks. And another one said, you know, we have a Chinese version, but uh, tomorrow you're going to get an English one, right? And then we sat down, ordered one of these locks and uh, just, you know, built a small app to open this lock. I uh, started taking this lock uh, further apart and uh, just, you know, documented what we did, what we found, um, how this works. And the security angle, um, for a year, you know, we didn't think about it anymore. But then we had the Gulash uh, programming night in Karlsruhe. And uh, we've had... And there's this, you know, famous uh, bike sharing company that works together with municipalities and other companies. And so they have this uh, touchpad. Um, uh, they, they had that earlier to open them. And now we saw that, you know, these locks look really familiar to us, right? And so we were like, hey, wait a second. We built an app for that. And then we just tried it out. So the question is, what the heck, like, why did these locks open? Because all of this communication between the locks and the app, you know, it's pretty okay. It's uh, transport encrypted and there's a unique unlock key, uh, just like with classical mechanical locks. Turns out the operator um, used the default keys that were printed in the documentation. They just didn't change them. And this is quite absurd because... That means that everyone who has the app installed, which opens the locks, carries around the default key. 
And then uh, we found out they don't even do Bluetooth. Um, these locks have a built-in SIM card, um, use uh, mobile internet, and when you click in your app, you know, they just unlock. And so they uh, forgot to lock the uh, Bluetooth communication down and just use the default keys. And then on uh, camp this year, we also uh, found that uh, these um, keys are also part in uh, not just in bike, uh, not just in bike locks, but also chain locks. Um, scooters. When we talk about scooters, you know, we we always think of these uh, sharing scooters that are all the hype right now. Um, but it's always this, you know, hype-driven startups. You know, we had uh, bike sharing before, and then we had uh, scooters apparently a long way back. But they're well known for quite another fact because there's lots of these operators in um, lots of operators in uh, operating in the same cities. And this leads to the situation that, you know, five different apps, you want to use a scooter, it doesn't work well with public transport, and basically it's just about, I want to find the nearest means of transportation for me. It could be public transport, could be a scooter, and it would be so nice to have one app for all of that. And of course there's a standard for that called GBFS, um, which is intended to, um, you know, give out position data of vehicles, of transportation vehicles, um, and make them public. But none of these scooter operators um, actually use this standard. So again, it's like uh, building a platform, building a monopoly, and nobody else can access it. But again, you know, it's apps, and they have to have uh, data somewhere in the background, and there have to be APIs. And then we started um, documenting these APIs. Um, we did that for bike sharing, but for the scooter sharing, there were lots and lots of APIs. Um, and so we just uh, concentrated on where are the scooters right now, on the location data. And yeah, so we went through all these operators and then we thought, wait, we know this API, don't we? We've, we've seen that before. And you know they they do something so differently. They they have different investors, um, but they all use this sh the same API. And so it turns out it was all bought. And uh, this is a famous German song from the nineties. <laughs> Yeah, and so we're back to the gold rush and the shovels and the digging. There's multiple software companies building this uh, software for sharing systems and selling them. And so if I want to be, you know, you know, if I want to operate a scooter sharing business, I just have to buy this, uh, put my sticker on it, um, buy scooters, put my sticker on it, buy software and um, roll it out and, uh, you know, start up done. And not everyone does it that way. Um, there's also uh, operators building their own software. So one of them, um, we found their uh, admin login page when we were looking for their API. And, you know, modern web development. Oh, there's a login screen. We don't have the login data, right? But of course, the whole source is being loaded. And so we can just uh, check what APIs do they talk with internally. And you know, what APIs need authentication and which don't. And that really sucks when the um, API dealing with customer data doesn't need any sort of authentication. And yeah, the media really got on that um, here with the Bavarian uh, radio, um, which had reports on this. And so, you know, we just wanted the location data for scooters, and then suddenly you have these, uh, yeah, this private user data. Um, but really, what we wanted to show is where are the scooters um, and document that. And so it didn't take long for people to start building apps uh, in which multiple operators location data was combined um, and then we also uh, were able to check with with which APIs these apps talk 
And so one step further is to see where are the scooters actually. Um, but also, uh, you know, these scooters have pretty much unique IDs. And so we can just check, um, like, where is it now? Where has it been? And where will it go? And so I can check um, the starting point of a rental and the end point of a rental ride. And then I can visualize this. And so uh, the City Lab Berlin um, did exactly this, did this nice visualization. And, um, you know, it looks great, right? But you can actually use that to uh, analyze traffic within a city to see from which point A to which point B uh, do people move about in the city and to optimize for that. Yeah, stuff like that. Cutter? The Los Angeles Department of Transportation did something similar and they were thinking of something similar because on the West Coast, um, that's where the whole scooter hype started and suddenly the city had thousands of scooters lying around and they were wondering, well, maybe we should figure out where these scooters are and maybe we should somehow intervene in where these scooters end up. And one thing that is somewhat uncommon for a government institution is that they came up with a technical standard, the mobility data specification, which describes that, which basically says that providers need to register every single vehicle, but also need to report once a scooter um, is, has to be repaired and is being removed from the city streets. They also provide data about the rentals and where people go, which really helps do traffic planning. Uh, basically, what we're just talking about, where do people go, which areas do they not use, um, maybe because there's a new bike lane that's just bad. But on the other hand, it's not just about data from providers, but the city itself also provides data and traffic data. There are several, for example, with regards to areas where people really like uh, parking their scooters, but also areas and times where you maybe don't want to, where maybe you don't want to park scooters because there's going to be a marathon the next day. So LA also passed an ordinance that specifies that once a scooter provider wants to offer their services in LA, then they have to fulfill the specification. And this standard was developed completely openly on GitHub, and that doesn't mean that it was just put on there and is now kind of just getting moldy there, but it's continuously being updated by the city of LA, but also by other cities um, and by providers and volunteers. So they didn't just write the standard that they published, but they also put the entirety of the software online that they use for regulation um, and this use implementation. All of that is available on GitHub. All of that is also open source and is now also being implemented and developed, further developed by other cities. So we were wondering, okay, so that's also all of that is actually pretty cool. So cities are regulating scooters without classically sending people onto the streets with paper that tell the scooters that they're parked in the wrong place. So how can we port this to somewhere else? Because it's good and there's ready-made software for this. And so we did some research and we realized that except for us, nobody in the German-speaking world seems to have discovered this. So we wrote a few blog posts where we explained this and we also created a kind of sign and explanation on a piece of paper which you can really hand to people um, who work in city administration because they really like things printed on paper. At the time, the timing was really good because the cities mostly thought of these pictures. This is in Munich where about a year ago, O-Bike basically just dumped um, thousands of bikes in the city which were just kind of lying around everywhere and the city was really not happy about it. But in addition to that, Scooters weren't legal in Germany yet at the time, but it was kind of becoming obvious that this legalization was probably going to happen at some time reasonably soon. In addition to that, all scooter providers had announced, or many scooter providers had announced that they wanted to become active in the German market. So the cities were scared and really had a strong interest in some kind of regulation. And we were, well, that's kind of stupid because we don't actually know which cities we should talk to. We just wrote some kind of blog post. Nobody's going to read that. So we started researching where do these providers want to go. And so Maxi had this amazing idea. Well, they all want to go to all these different cities. And of course, they want employees in these cities. And so they have job postings. And so we just crawled all these job postings to look at which providers wanted to go to which cities. So we've created this map with this beautiful map which tells you 
uh, which city has how many providers who want to go there. You can see which state they want to go into. Every uh, every German federal state has at least one, except for Saarland. Well, and then we got these uh, cities and sent them emails, um, which was something like, hello, do you know, are you aware of this whole scooter thing that's coming your way? Do you have a plan for regulating it? Uh, have you heard of the mobility data specification? Uh, well, maybe you haven't, but we've prepared a blog post. You should read it. Um, we also got a lot of feedback about it. And then what that led to is that now um, Hamburg, Ulm, and several cities in North Rhine-Westphalia are actually using this mobile data specification and are demanding that this type of information from all providers there. So, that means what we realized, if you recognize a topic in time and you look at which technical specifications or solutions exist, come up with something that might make sense and then we give that to the municipalities and talk to them constructively, then you can just make policy and implement your own solutions. And yeah, it worked incredibly well. And maybe there are other topics that you were interested where you realized in time that something interesting might happen. Well, it might make sense to just go up to people and talk to them. Another thing that's also really nice about the mobility data specification is that the providers are not just providing the location of the scooters to the municipality, but that they also have to be provided in this GPFS format and that it's provided in specifically provided as open data. And open data is exactly the right thing for this because it means that this data is available for anyone without registration at no cost at a free license. And that's exactly what you need if you want to if you want to integrate the location of scooters into your own apps or analyses. And funnily, that's exactly what LAM wanted to do with the mobile data specification, which was to essentially break up these platforms and provide us a bit and make mobility easier for everyone. The absurd thing about the whole thing is that now we are um, demanding open data from private providers. But with regards to public transport, which are being paid for and operated by the government, um, this whole open data thing doesn't really look super well because su st things such as stops, um, lo like locations uh, or schedules would be incredibly important from these providers, but we don't even have those in many cases. So we came up with three examples. The first is DigiTransit. Digi digi you can use that to use the data to pr basically provide um, an information provision platform. DigiTransit is an open source routing stack that was developed in Helsinki in Finland and that we could just implement for ourselves. And the beautiful thing is that it's not just about a, like a nice way of providing public transport data, but because once you start getting GPFS, you can also implement um, and integrate bikes, car sharing, scooters. So what it basically does is that it tries to integrate as many different ways of mobility and portray as many of them, visualize as many of them as possible at the same time. Another um, thing that goes a bit further is the decentralized car sharing, uh, the decentralized ride sharing, Mitfahrtdezentrale in German where you basically can do mobility for other people because it essentially understands these different types of mobility as extensions of public transport. So there's these different ride-sharing platforms and all of them are turned in... Um, you essentially scrape recurring routes from these ride-sharing platforms and then you can put those into DigiTransit to enable people to figure out how they can get from a place that maybe doesn't have a bus um, and how they can get from there to somewhere that actually has a public transport stop or traffic transport location. Another nice project uh, is one that was shared to me on the uh, Bahn hackathon a few weeks ago. It was uh, called Missing Buses and it was about uh, using uh, public transport data and um, demographic data to find out in which area where p areas where people live is there a lack of public transport, um, but where one bus route would be enough to um, connect these buses to the uh, network at large and uh, make people less dependent on their cars. We have more than 100 uh, public transport authorities in Germany and only very few of them open up their data. And we are often asked, what can I do to get this uh, data? And we notice that it's not very 
efficient to ask these authorities themselves because all they do is they drive buses. They're, they're, they exist to drive trams and buses and that's what they get, give uh, money for. What they get money for. <laughs> um, they, they also develop timetables, but uh, essentially they get financed by the, um, by the municipalities. And we, that's why we started a uh, project called Rette Dein Nahverkehr, Save Your Public Transport. And you can uh, enter your postcode and you get a generated PDF that you can then print out. And it uh, tells you why mobility data is great and why it's great and it important for municipalities and the nice thing is it worked lots of people used this thank you very much to all of you who used it it actually changed things we could use it to accelerate this process in many uh, transport authorities and in some cities this was what first got this topic onto the agenda and what finally opened up uh, public transport data. Another player in mobility is uh, Deutsche Bahn, the German railway company. Uh, they have an open data portal. It uh, contains lots of nice data. It has an interface that tells you which uh, elevator is currently running and which isn't. So if I'm doing my own routing because I'm, uh, well, I can, I can, I can see. Okay, I have uh, reduced mobi uh, mobility, so I'm not going to use this station because the elevator is not wor working. But I can use this alternative station, and so I can adapt my route. But the thing that they don't have is what everybody wants. It's uh, timetable data, and there's a lot of work still to be done. Feel free to um, annoy Deutsche Bahn a bit more to uh, and t to tell them that they should publish that data. And we have car sharing companies. Some of them say, "Yeah, wealth data." <laughs> I mean, should we should we tell you where our cars are? No, it's a it's a company secret. And if you want to have that secret, to tell potential customers where where. A, where one of their cars are, then they um, want to have license fees for that. It sounds like Germany's ancillary copyright law. And we thought that was bullshit. Those, everybody who, has, who offers mobility solutions should open up their data if they're using the public space for that. And it's not even very extraordinary. This is law in Finland, for example. And that's why we're saying, as long as this is not law in Germany, <laughs> people who don't want to play along are going to find their data published on transitbay.org. It's a platform where, public, uh, where scraped data can be uploaded. Um, and it's not even that illegal there's no copyright for uh, factual data it i mean it is fact that there is a bus running uh, a certain route at 18:30 in the evening i doubt that this reaches the, uh, the threshold of originality and neither is it um is it uh, is there a copyright on the fact that there's a scooter in a certain place and um of course this does not guarantee that uh, the uh, startups from Silicon Valley are going to come along and uh, platformize mobility. And um, so, what's uh, the alternative to this? Can we maybe build our own mobility? So, and building our own sounded interesting. So we um, we uh, had a look. Driving our own trams sounded fun, but it's very expensive. So um, we got back to the original idea. And that was bike sharing in places where there isn't any bike sharing yet. So uh, we uh, looked for a cheap mode of transport and considered options of doing that. And a great thing happened last year or this year. It was camp. And it allowed us to experiment. And um, we asked people to bring along bikes that they might have sitting uh, 
in their basement and bring it to camp and we'd build a backend and web app and uh, some combination locks for the bikes. And so we sat down and built a bit of hardware as well and printed it. And it allowed us to plot the uh, location of bikes on a map. And so camp happened and this call for bikes worked. We had more bikes than we had uh, trackers and people showed up borrowed a bike that we uh, <laughs> only just screwed a tracker on and uh, went on their merry way. And as all bike sharing companies do, we lost all our bikes the first night because we didn't have any monitoring for the trackers. You learn a lot when you do this kind of thing. And thanks a lot to everyone who gave us a bike and to those who uh, built the software at camp. Something that surprised us was that these purple dots started appearing on the official camp map because we uh, simply uh, offered the uh, location of these bikes as GBFS and because there's documentation for GBFS and there's a specification, people who built this map were able to plot the location of the bikes on the map. And we only started notice, noticing this when the, the uh, server load started increasing a, increasing a bit. And of course, we didn't only want to build this for camp. Our motivation was to have bike sharing in our city. But unfortunately, bike sharing companies aren't very interested in the city of Ulm because Ulm has a, a problematic mountain well, we have a lot of mountains, actually, and bikes have this <laughs> annoying habit of liking to ride down hills but not up, and that makes bike sharing a bit difficult. But so we thought, can we maybe have it in the city center first and uh, then think about e-bikes later? That would be great, wouldn't it? So we said, this is our motivation, this is what we want to do, and we started telling people that we want to build our own bike sharing and started building it. And the city of Ulm said, hey, bike sharing sounds great, we want to have it. But then there was this matter of... Uh, that all open, the, the problem that all open source problems face, where people suddenly stop working for it. And that's why the city of Ulm said, hey, what do you think? We're going to pay you to build open source bike sharing. And we're building open data by default into this. Of course, this system is going to return this open, uh, retain this open API. So everybody who sets up one of these instances is going to have open data by default. And it's very difficult, actually, to pull this out of it. And of course, the problem is going to remain open source. It's important. This problem, uh, this project is being paid for by public money, and that's why the code has to be public as well and has to be open source. And the city of Ulm has used one of their, well, has used a lot of funding for that. And usually when a city that gets money, all other cities that um, applied for this aren't getting anything, but this is not the case with open source because all other cities can use this system as well. They can run their own system instance and then they have bike sharing too. Reality check though. I don't know how realistic you think it is that all cities are going to run a system like this. There's a lack of technical expertise in cities and mun municipalities and authorities. And it's a topic that we've uh, laughed at a lot over the past 10 years, but laughing at people hasn't really worked. So maybe it's time to realize 
that the people in this room and in the streams and in this scene have expertise and maybe these people should use that expertise and offer it to municipalities and show them what great stuff you can build, build things like departure monitors. Don't just build them in your hack spaces. Tell people about it. Tell your, tell the restaurant next door to have it. Um, tell them how great it is to make mobility visible. Because only if you, if it's visible, then those mobility solutions are going to get the money that they need. Start setting up open source projects. These are great because lots of people started uh, running software like this and uh, started developing it and um, that made it better and talk about it and if you need data then uh, request it show what you've built speak to the right people go to the municipalities go to cities authorities and tell them what great stuff you built and maybe you want to start uh, not just uh, talking to municipalities but actually work from the inside hack mobility from the inside thank you Thanks a lot for the thanks a lot for this amazing talk. So we'll now get to Q and A. Um, if you have any questions, just come to the mics here um, and just line up there. Thank you for the talk. When O-Bike started in Berlin, they said that um, company secrets definitely include the usage of mobility data, but this doesn't really fit with your open data approach, does it? Yeah, the, so also when this entire hype happened of these uh, providers from Asia, they had all these slides that said things such as the whole thing about private data, but I haven't heard anything of them getting data. So I think, I don't know about bikes, and at least for the scooters when it became such a big thing, I know that also the administrations themselves, city administrations themselves didn't even know where these scooters were. So they also asked for this data and so they specifically requested this location information. Well, that worked great. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. I um, started a petition in my city and there's a lot more of those happening. Did you network in that scene? Is there anything they can learn from you or you can learn from them? Well, we um, actually, in Ulm, we are actually talking to the uh, ADFC, which is a biking club which did something in that regard as well. In 2011, I think we already had a petition on the local political level as well that they wanted to have 20% of all tra transport to be t bikes by 2020. Guess what didn't happen? And we are definitely in touch with people there and are discussing how we might be able to push this further to, by cooperating. But yeah, come talk to us. The next question microphone 5, please. Thanks again for the talk. Are you planning to extend this project to other cities long term? Because it's not brilliant if all the uh, cities are doing their own thing. And do you have any suggestion for generating money for this? Oh, I have a suggestion, actually. If uh, many university towns include bike sharing in their, um, in their semester tickets, in their public transport tickets, and uh, the universities are fairly, or the student associations are fairly unhappy with these uh, commercial companies, and they'd be happy to invest money that's currently going to Nextbike into non-commercial bike sharing projects. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, so what we're focused on is uh, turning all of this into software. Obviously, we're working with the city of Ulm, and so now we have a prototype there that we can use to learn. And what we're really interested in is also making sure that administration is something that you can do yourself, because we don't want to put ourselves out there and say that we're providers of bike sharing, but we want it to be possible for people who are interested in it to be able to implement it. That can be a university, but that can also be a small tourism association or a hack space that you can essentially do it yourself and try. And in addition to that, we also, this whole thing about every city doing their own thing, that's also kind of part of the idea that you're not supposed to register in 10 different systems, but what we hope is possible that you can kind of have a system um, that, that is basically these systems can talk to each other, but we don't have the software for that yet. I'm impressed with what you've been building in a very short amount of time, respect for that. But there's one aspect that I would like to um, ask about, this using of uh, public data usually come, uh, or also means that you should protect private data. And once this data is in the hands of a municipality, how long is it going to take until this uh, until it becomes until they, they get very interested in how they can use uh, data of uh, the pos well position data for for vehicles to, for example, prevent terrorism and. If all of this uh, is within the same framework and maybe even across several operators, it's going to be even more difficult to prevent that. The funny thing about this is that LA was thinking of exactly the same thing. They published a sp pretty long white paper that also included the technical plans, which this was a part of, and but they were also doing other things. They very clearly have that on their radar and so in the MDS it also says that this what the data that providers um, submit cannot have any relation to customer customers cannot have any identifi identifying information those things should not be linked and that's also what I consider the solution here um, that they're kind of going past the goal here which is what's funny because they're basically trying to come up with some kind of scare campaign but the people who develop MDS, and you can also just participate in that, that's a GitHub repo, they have a mailing list, um, and their weekly calls or something like that. And so they're definitely thankful for input on our totally stand behind something like that as well. Another thing is that I don't know what, what the difference would be between this data being with a provider and being with the city, because if the police wants to have access to this data, then they can probably get it from the city and the police, uh, then these private providers in similar ways. I don't know. But it's definitely a topic and it's definitely a thing. Um, there were also already attempts, especially with regards to the rights. So when right data is being submitted to the relevant institutions, that maybe you could get rid of But that maybe you could um, make anonymization easier by uh, cutting off a random bit in the beginning of the end of the route. I don't know how, mu how exactly and how well that anonymization works. Maybe you should have a look at a kind of data set uh, to see whether this is an actual option. <laughs> Brilliant hacks and a great talk. Thank you very much. I was missing one thing, though. It's the infrastructure of cities. You talked a lot about bicycles, but you can probably use that data to find out where people are riding their bikes and where you should build a bike path. I mean, those exist, but they don't tend to be very safe. Are you in touch with people who are trying to buy build uh, cycle paths where they're needed? I mean, we also know the typical campaigns that are working on stuff like this. Um, such as ADFC, which you are also probably aware of. But infrastructure, obviously, is a very important topic. Infrastructure is really bad in this country. We should really invest way more money into it. And that's, funnily, this is also something that you can pour to somewhere else. 
And just as we have no bike infrastructure, we also have very little infrastructure on the municipal level to just host a project like this or just implement something like this. And that really needs a lot more political focus. And that's something that really makes this very, very obvious that there is a deficit here. This whole routing thing doesn't really help you, and this routing data doesn't help you if the only piece of information you get is that the only bus you could take leaves at 7.30 a.m. People need, we need to focus on this much more to not only see the problems, but feel the pain and then hopefully do something about it. And maybe in addition to that, also go and say we don't, we're not doing something like save your public transport, but a campaign such as like save your bike lane, um, and start implementing campaigns like that. Die nächste Frage von Mikrofon 6, bitte. Hi, uh, I'm a student from Karlsruhe. Do you know if uh, the uh, public, uh, if the biking company in Karlsruhe has already fixed that vulnerability? Way they sent us an email where they said that they fixed the vulnerability and switched the Bluetooth keys. We couldn't check. Oh, it actually doesn't work anymore. Ah, that's a shame. But thanks. I'd like to pick up where you ended your talk and you, you said that you, that people should go into a public administration and into politics, and I think it's important that we don't simply don't don't just use congresses like these to build on a build uh, build things and then only reach up peer groups. We should actually um, get society into the uh, digital age, and it feels to me that. These uh, municipalities are often approached by companies that want to sell them studio solutions that are then um, taken up by politics. But we're the people who have this kind of competency and we should uh, take it to where it's uh, desperately needed. Thank you very much. Am microphone three, please. Thanks a lot for the talk. Maybe you'd like to say one or two sentences about the open bike sharing that you're building. You said you're mainly hacking away at the software, but what about the hardware? Do you have any bikes in Ulm that you that are refurbished or maybe bought new? What are the plans and how realistic is it that you can tell your municipality, hey, here's a system, all you need is bikes and off we go? We were extremely lucky because we actually found some money in the city that we could use, that we were able to use to buy 20 bikes. So we just provided this very basic infrastructure um, that you can play around with. Locks, we're ba really starting from a very basic starting point, such as what you know from the, from camp this summer, with the basic number lock um, is what we're using right now, but we're also looking into other options and maybe putting some other things together, building a, possibly building a prototype, how you could maybe implement and realize something like this. Um, to also put this, implement this on a hardware level. Because it doesn't really help if we just buy them from somewhere else. And that's also something, all of that is already on this GitHub repo. And what we've also written down in a lot of detail where we kind of started from and what we wanted to achieve with this open bike sharing. And by now, the GitHub repo also, github.com slash Radforschung, also includes not just all the software data, but also an experimental software for the trackers for these bikes. And then soon there will hopefully also be locks. And then in addition to this, another appeal. If you're interested in this, come talk with us, talk to us. This is a really interesting thing. You can do this in a decentralized way, in a, like beautifully. If there's a hack space that wants to build some hardware or just wants to give us some hack space, uh, some bikes that we can use in some where we can try some stuff, that, that makes it easier. And the more we can do um, together, and the more people participate, the easier we can do this and check out, try whether, for example, our roaming idea works as well. In addition to that, it might also be interesting 
if you also start implementing a similar system in different places, because obviously different cities are different in terms of application, so it would obviously be interesting to not for us to, for us to not just build it for the city that the case that we know, which is Ulm, but also figure out how this would work in other places where there might be problems that we had not, maybe not even thought of. And in addition, with regards to hardware, we are also, yeah, we definitely want to try something there. I um, was wondering about use cases. There are these um, high load bicycles. Um, do, you, do you know if they're being used anywhere? We've been contacted about this by several people already. We just don't have a ready-made lock yet. So if you want to have one of these high-load bikes, that's also slightly more valuable than the typical ride-sharing bike. You really need a proper a bit more there. And with regards to these bikes, they're also amazing, but you need at least 15 minutes of an introduction to learn how to use them, especially you if it's one where you have kind of the load in front and it suddenly completely changes the weight of the bike and how you how it drives it how it's driven so we're not entirely certain actually how to integrate something like that into the system to properly integrate into the system because how do you essentially do this introduction the next question from microphone 3 hi super talk great talk thank you what about maintenance, maintaining the fleet, things such as tire pressure or brakes? This is going to become relevant sooner or later. Do you have any thoughts? So we have a maintenance module which can say where you, which you can put to this um, vehicle is currently under maintenance. What we were thinking is what can we do with implementing this, and so. We said that for starters, we're going to try to implement this ourselves. And so if something is broken, we're just going to do it ourselves and fix something broken ourselves. Especially with regards to maintenance and real provision and operation, that's something where we will learn a lot and where we have to learn a lot. And that's also something where we're motivated and part of our motivation because we know that we need to learn how to even operate a operate and how to do bike sharing. And then this type of information that we learn there, we also don't want to just keep that to ourselves. But the stuff that we're learning and can try in this practical test, we're going to document all of that so other people don't have to make the same mistakes again that we're making. Well, then another round of applause. Um, you're listening to the English translation um, for Hack Your Own Mobility Revolution. <laughs>